when you start getting that adrenaline rush, you're like, oh my gosh, I'm able to do these things. <laughs> you're like, I have like a superpower, right? It's like, it's so weird. It's like, and I, and I think that's how hackers get started, honestly, is they feel that adrenaline rush and they go, whoa, I have a power here. I can do these things, right? <laughs> Welcome to our Read podcast. Uh, so I'm really glad to have you here. And I'm pretty sure that the main topics today will be really interesting for our audience, especially when it comes to cybersecurity. Keith Coleman, uh, another way that you can find me is on Instagram as Keith's Lens. Um, so right now I work as a cybersecurity uh, engineer, cloud engineer, uh, you know, just coming out of junior pen tester, becoming a penetration tester and red teamer. So um yeah it was all it's a long road to get here i guess but anybody can do it so that's kind of what we're going to be discussing today as well all right that's great that's exactly the topic that i wanted to discuss today because everyone is discussing about cybersecurity and how it's actually so vast and how can people really get it started into the tech world so if you have any tips on that and if you can share you know, some tips mm. of your knowledge as an engineer. Yeah, absolutely. I'd love to, um, you know, a lot of people always say, <laughs> uh, buy my course or do these, uh, funny things. And I don't necessarily agree with it at all. Uh, now one way I would definitely like to tell people is this, you know, don't be afraid to start off small, uh, starting at a help desk position or tech support position will actually teach you a lot on how to work with various teams how to be dynamic, right? Um, and your knowledge becomes to get vast. It's it's the absolute truth. I mean, I started out working as, uh, you know, while being in school, um, I was working as a physical security person, right? We were armed, right, for the banks and stuff like that. So I went, if you think about it, I went from secu physical security to cybersecurity. Now, of course, there's some little things in between. But what's the difference between the two, uh, the two of them that you mentioned before? Oh, sure. I mean, one of them we were uh, actually patrolling in vehicles and protecting like people, like the banks and things like that. Um, and uh, a lot of our guys were armed with a gun uh, to make sure, you know, kind of like police in a way, right? Oh. Uh, except just policing for certain properties, essentially, and then. Uh, which was crazy hours and I don't, I only recommend it for people who don't have a steady pay <laughs> and who need it while they're going to school. Cause honestly, it's very easy to become a security guard, security officer, whatever you're trying to do. Um, you know, it's again, it's good if you're going to school and stuff like that, but it's very tiring. It can be, uh, but anyway, yeah. So if you're really looking to get into your first, like, let's say tech position, there's so many, uh, certifications out there that are, um, you know, very cheap to get, uh, very easy to absorb the knowledge. And I'm not talking about CompTIA. I don't, I'm one of the very few <laughs> that is gonna say, I don't agree with the CompTIA certifications. Um, they charge you quite a bit of money for the voucher uh, and it takes forever to study. And yeah, it's some good knowledge, but you're gonna forget it. I, I, I know you will. <laughs> and, and that's okay because a lot of the knowledge you get will be retained on the job that you're in. So um, I actually recommend people to go to Coursera and there's a few certifications on there even. For example, you have the IBM technical support, you have Google technical support, um, and I believe Microsoft has one as well. And they even have cybersecurity certifications now, uh, both Microsoft and Google, and they're called professional certificates. So once you complete all the courses, you actually get a really nice verified certificate through Credly. Which it's you're going to get actually able to work if you get a certification just from Coursera. Are you actually certified to work? And what kind of um, internship programs do you probably have to get to actually be able to become, um, like in your case, a cloud security engineer? Yeah. So cloud security engineer, you don't really just jump right into this usually. And if you do, you're one of it's the, one of the very odd ones. You usually want to start off trying to go for analyst positions. Uh, a lot of times people will say cybersecurity in general is uh, not necessarily an entry level 
uh, position to start in, which is kind of true, right? You, you again, you want to have some knowledge with something. Again, I started with security, then I went to uh, remote help desk position, which is like tech support. So I started there to understand everything. And then I continued my studying of cybersecurity because that's a really long story in of itself about how I even was interested in it um, since I was a kid. But yeah, you really want to start off small. If you're, if you're not able to jump right into uh, cybersecurity right away, because it is different for everybody, right? You need to start off small and go to get like a help desk position, tech support position, start working with your managers, talking to them about your interests. And if, they're, if it's not working for them, you continue studying. You keep making your resume look better. Um, think about all the security things you do right now. For example, like you're monitoring your email, you're doing all these things to stop, you know, you know, phishing or anything like that. Anything to really beef up that resume helps. Okay, creating that really nice portfolio of just, hey, these are all the certifications I have and this is what I'm really focused on because you don't want to get certifications that are for this, that, and the other, right? There's different positions in cybersecurity. And yeah, it's nice to have everything sometimes, but when you're first starting out, they want to see that you're streamlined, you're focused. Um, yeah, so if you're if you're really just trying to jump head into cybersecurity, you want to be an analyst, let's say this, learn Python. Python's an amazing programming language, okay? It makes so that you can automate uh, pretty much anything, right? Logs, for example, we have to monitor a lot of logs if you're an analyst. Uh, seeing if there's anything out of the ordinary, to say the least. Um, and then, of course, again, get those certifications because they kind of teach you other things on how to document the process, how to speak with your stakeholders, um, things of that nature. And Karina, one other thing I want to note, too, is this. Um, sure. It's not always it's not always the person who's most technical that gets the job. It's the person who knows how to speak really well. <laughs> Oh my, I actually didn't know that. I mean, a lot of people, obviously, if you know how to speak, that's a great advantage. If you're a great speaker, obviously, even when it comes to yeah. other jobs. Um, Absolutely. What are certain things that we need to know exactly when it comes to, I don't know, communicating with our employees or having like a better understanding what this job really means? Yeah, so... Let's say, are you saying as if you're in the position already, like an analyst or things like that, or yeah, let's engineer. say that. Yeah, yeah. So um, I guess part of my engineering duties, because I kind of went in between being an analyst and an engineer, but um, part of my duties was always making sure that all employees were aware that hey, you're gonna get phishing attempts, phishing emails that look super similar to some of the tools exactly. that you use now. It right. happened also to us, so we, we, we know exactly. Then I will get also to another question that will be actually sure. the following question after after this oh, one. Yeah. No worries. Yeah, no, it's uh, it's interesting. We definitely create these, um, well, I should say I've created, I've created a lot of uh, fake campaigns to make it look like phishing attempts and they could report them so that employees would start getting used to the fact like, hey, I really should not be clicking these things anymore, right? Um, we did campaigns to show like to create videos for them and say, Hey, this is kind of how they do it. And this is how you're able to check the email to see if like, should I click on it? Should I not, uh, or should I report it to the security team? Right. So, you know, that's one of the ways to keep everybody in line. Um, the next thing of course, too, is always making sure that, you know, all of your assets, meaning like anything like your phones, your computers are all updated all programs are updated and patched uh with the newest uh, updates for security stuff usually um you know we're always monitoring newsletters that come out you know especially about security concerns it's one of our biggest things right always being there and uh being very good with googling google dorking <laughs> um really? is another term um yeah, it's so that's one of the ways that we definitely do that. And of course, we're always scanning people's machines as well to make sure that there's no like malware or anything like that. You know, we have uh, next gen uh, antivirus, which all companies are moving towards now. It's just a newer antivirus. Um, you know, using a VPN is also very helpful, right? It's covering all your tracks, it's the easiest way to put it. Um, so those are just like some very basic ways that people can avoid from downloading malicious files, opening the wrong email, and now you have account takeover uh, of some sort because 
uh, hackers or malicious hackers, if you want to call them, can create websites that look incredibly similar to a website you visited before. They just have a different link, maybe like a different letter or a different number. Something's different uh, that you'll, you won't even notice sometimes. And you put your login information on there and now they have everything. They have everything the that you question you're is, how can you actually be a target, you know, when it comes to these hackers? How can you become their target? Are just, you know, uh, celebrities or can be also ordinary people, enterprises? Like, you know, how can we oh. ensure that our data is actually protected? Yeah, I mean, it is literally everybody. It doesn't matter who you are, unfortunately. Um, yeah. And one way it happens, too, is there's so many websites, actually. Like, if you look up... Um, uh, who x y uh, dot com or anything like that there are so many of these uh, open source intelligence tools also known as OSINT right that anybody can find your information anywhere so if you bought a domain and you didn't buy domain protection for example they will be able to see your entire name and email uh, like your personal email to see who owns that domain even if it was from 10 years ago it doesn't matter they're gonna they're gonna find that and then now that's one way they're going to be like, okay, perfect. I know who owns the domain. He must own either the company or must be a head of something. So now they're going to kind of go after like your employees through LinkedIn. Now they'll look on LinkedIn to see like, oh, this is the company. This is the people working in that company, right? Because everything is public knowledge and that's what's kind of scary. Um, so you want to check your settings and everything, making sure that maybe your data is only uh, within LinkedIn and uh, is only being shared to your uh, you know, your vast network that you have. Um, another way is there's actually tools, I forget the name of it right now, but if you go on Google and type in delete my information from the internet, there's paid tools out there that are pretty cheap that assist in deleting as much as they can on you, like your digital footprint essentially. And that could help too. But a lot, I mean, for example, my, my uh, email, because I've had it for so many years, you know, you, you sign up for so many things, right? Is on the dark web. It's for sure on the dark web. Yeah, someone has someone has been targeting it. And they're not able to get in. There's been no success, but it's there. And um, how can you get into the dark web? That's also another question that I have. That's a very oh, interesting question. <laughs> yeah, there's, there, there's, on, yeah, usually it's through the Tor browser, like there's this like Onion Tor browser, like that's one way. And then you have to have uh, specialized links to access certain areas on the dark web, uh, which is very creepy stuff. Like um, it can, like there's many weird websites you can go on there. For example, buying uh, firearms to even worse stuff, right? Uh, one of the best people I would watch if you're really trying to watch an example of it is uh, Network Chuck or David Bomble, my two of my favorite guys in the industry. I think uh, they're so incredibly fascinating to watch. Uh, their YouTube videos are great and in depth. They put a lot of work into it. Um, and they really do show on the best ways, I guess, that you could get in, do some open source intelligence in there. But yeah, it's a creepy place and, and creepy things happen there for sure. Yeah, I, I totally get that. Also, another question that I have is, does somehow AI and machine learning have an important aspect for, I don't know, threat detection or cybersecurity attacks? Oh, a thousand percent. Um, ChatGPT is getting better on recognizing, um, recognizing like uh, certain, let's say, programming for malicious code, right? So there's other websites now that cybersecurity people are using and even just malicious people are using to create this malicious piece of code where it's like the perfect code. That's the scary part. So they could start attacking websites no way. for creating these zero day, uh, zero day exploits, which by the way, zero day is something that hasn't been found yet. It's something that's new, right? It's like a new attack. So therefore, how do you defend against a new attack? It can be difficult. So um, something like someone hasn't dealt with before, right? Uh, and that's what's scary about AI is it can totally come up with things like that. But I'm honestly actually happy for AI because it's smoothed out a lot of my process um, and smoothed out a lot of other, you know, departments process. And I think ChatGPT or AI in general, artificial intelligence in general within cloud computing, 
um, as well as cybersecurity actually helped automations. It's just another tool that you have to use and be ready for like anything else. Um, and you want to make sure you're using best secure practices at the end of the day. Like it doesn't matter what you use. Um, for example, we're using Zoom right now. So we got to be careful with everything, right? Our own Zoom accounts, if you have contacts on it, anything like it's just another tool. Yeah, but it's very good. But how can someone really break into your account? What are other options they can really break into your account and other ways to protect yourself? Let's say it's me in this case, Karina, as a journalist, not an enterprise, but just an ordinary person, I would say. Yeah, I mean, if you're just an ordinary person looking to lock down your accounts for the most part and the easiest way to do it, and I'm not saying that that this method is your uh, your golden ticket, like you're going to be okay, but the best way is two-factor yeah. authentication, right? Multi-factor authentication. Um, it's If you don't know what that is, it is an ever-revolving code um, or it's a code that can be sent to your phone once you try logging into your account, right? So you enter your, your username, your email, and then it goes, oh, we just sent you a code. You need to put that code in to get into your account. That is a you know, two factor authentication. So it's the second factor to show you are who you are. It's verifying who you are. Um, and I recommend, I mean, there's a lot of cool, uh, you know, cool websites or apps you can use. Um, I like Bitwarden, it's free. It helps, it's a password manager tool, but it also has like, like the one-time passwords in there that keep revolving every like 10 seconds or so. Um, that way it's very difficult for a hacker to get into into any of your um, accounts, right? Because the code keeps changing, it's very difficult. If it's on your phone though, if you get a text to your phone, that can be scary, okay? Because social okay. engineering, social engineering, someone can call your, I don't know what phone provider you have. Um, I'm not gonna say which one I phone have. provider, by the way. Yeah, it's a Swiss phone provider, but uh, can you actually, okay. another question that I have, can you actually also yeah. get them, um, I don't know, by phone calls? Because I heard a lot of these incidents lately. Yeah, absolutely. It's uh, Rachel Toback is another name, by the way. She's really cool. She's a hacker that's pretty known in the DEF CON world uh, who has done competitions and is also one of an expert social engineer, okay? And she shows that when she called a top CEO's, a top CEO's uh, phone provider, she acted like she was, I think, if I remember correctly, one of the family members being on the phone, put a fake noise in the background of being at the airport with a baby crying. Oh my God, you can actually do that. Yeah. Yes. And because of that, it, it provided a sense of urgency, right? Where she's like, I don't have time for this. I really need help right now. Can you please just transfer that information to this information? The person did it. So she was then able to kind of take complete control, like SIM swap almost, uh, take complete control of that phone, uh, that phone number, and all of the password or like the codes were sent to her phone instead, right? Oh my so anytime, God. and that's one way to do it. That's that's absolutely one way to do it, is being able to completely control that person's phone number or phone in general. So well, not the phone, but phone number, um, the account. So yeah, social engineering could be very scary. Um, there's different, and now with AI, actually, you could do fake voices now. Like people can take your voice or my voice. Yeah, true. And with enough dialogue, they can actually make it sound pretty good. And that, to me, that's worrying. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, another thing is because, uh, you know, some banking systems, when you're actually calling the bank, like in my case, they actually have this new option where they can recognize you just by your voice, you know, when you're speaking, you know, that's also wow. AI. But at the same time, what if you're sick one day and your voice just sounds really weird? <laughs> I mean, yeah. how can someone really, I don't know, can someone really fake being you or how can you actually really uh, make sure that that's actually you and not someone else trying to break in or someone else trying to be you. Right, I mean, that's when you have to look through your account settings or speak to someone at the bank and say, hey, this is my concern. What's another way I can log in, right? And that's where you have multi-factor authentication. Two-factor is, you know, you just have two ways. You have your password or you have your code, right? Multi-factor. Exactly. But now just they have introduced this, that's just a recent thing. But also my, my question is, yeah. 
what are some practices on how they are training AI to actually, you know, have, you know, a better quality and then, you know, show some improvements as the chat GBT did recently? Yeah. So when you're saying training it, that's, it's a bit broad because uh, it's so new that um, for anyone to say, I'm, gonna, I'm not going to lie to you, for any company to say that, uh, that they figured it out or they're, <laughs> they're training it, it's too new. I promise they're, they're still figuring out themselves. It's something you're uh, consistently kind of going with um, to see where it kind of messes up and it, you know, and making sure that you're not letting it enter certain systems. Like for example, I would never allow it to, especially now, I would never allow it to be in my database, right? So if it's anywhere we hold a ton of super important data, we cannot allow it in there. We allow it on the outside where it's like, we're asking it specific questions. We're asking it to help us create certain scripts for very certain scenarios, right? Uh, for example, I had this huge log. Like, I mean, it could fill my entire place up. Like, it's ridiculous. And I need to find two pieces of evidence. So I used a script or I had it help me create a script in order to find these two pieces of evidence. And it created a beautiful code for me, beautiful Python code. And um, that's the way we use it. So, and I know that's the way a lot of other places use it. Now, if we're talking about AI within, let's say, cloud computing, right? I highly doubt that they are using it in uh, in their databases. And if they are, great. Uh, maybe they maybe they did a, they have a huge team and they did a lot of work because it really comes down to time allocation. Um, but the way they're probably using using it inside of like cloud computing is helping create different uh, areas for places to hold data. So not in a database, but on the outside, helping kind of create saying, well, this process works better, right? It's more streamlined. So um, it, you know, there's that. And then of course you have APIs. APIs are cheaper. Um, so every, so ChatGPT has their own API that you can rent out. And it's, uh, it's cheaper to use for every call you make. And by calls, for example, even typing a little message on here is technically a call, but that costs more money if you're trying to use it as an organization, right? But with an API, it's like a couple cents, super cheap. Um, so yeah, it, 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 it's very hard to tell right now. I could tell you how we use it <clears throat> and go deeper into that, but other places, it's too new to tell, and they're not going to give away a lot of their information currently, just because it's kind of scary what ha like hackers can do, um, and how they can get a hold of your information just by using like AI, which has already happened. ChatGPT was already hacked, I believe. So, yeah, that's that's a really dangerous place, and you know everything is so unpredictable when it comes to AI, of course. And another question that I had that you mentioned before it's what are certain steps that you know need to be done actually conducting you know to ensure I don't know a strong cybersecurity system in an enterprise in a business on a you know bigger scale this time. Yeah, absolutely. So that's where kind of the engineers and uh, pen testers work together, right? And it's funny because I wear. Everywhere you go, you're going to wear multiple hats. <laughs> That's so. Be ready for that. Whoever is going to get a job in this field, because you are going to wear. You're never going to do what you were only signed up to do, <laughs> and that's okay. That's fine. It's fun. The changes. Um, so yeah, you work a lot with engineers at pen testing, and and from that angle, what you're talking about is running a pen test, right? And uh, a lot of times they'll have you do it in a development environment and not like a production environment, so that way you're not ruining any like client stuff at, you know, it's not ruining the website. It's not stopping processes. Um, you know, you start off with reconnaissance. You look at where can I break into, who is a target possibly in the company, like the, the head honchos, whatever have you, um, you know, from there they go into scanning, right? Uh, again, scanning with certain tools, uh, the entire system, especially if you have access already, um, or you're scanning from the outside as if you're like a, an actual hacker, which at that point is called a red teamer. Okay. So a pen, a pen tester is usually someone that already has pretty much credentials to log in. They have access to the network essentially, and they're going to conduct to see where they're vulnerable from the inside out. Red teaming is really trying to pretend like you're the attacker from without any knowledge, essentially 
and you're kind of attacking from the outside in, right? Um, so for me, I'm trying to get to that. I would love for them to let me do this, but they're scared. So I will just continue pen test. Um, but then you have vulnerability assessments. It kind of shows like you have some automated tools. And what's nice about those is it shows reports, right? Saying, hey, this might be a problem here. This might be a problem there. Um, you know, you should probably bring it up to remediate them. Uh, then number four, don't worry, the list is not too long, I promise. No, four don't, is worry. Your... don't worry, don't worry. I can keep going. That's so interesting. No, no, it's, don't worry. It just, it's an interesting process because you want to follow this very simplified process, but of course it's a little bit longer and you're creating a report the entire time that you're doing a, a pen test, right? This report is so important because um, it shows everything you did and how you found the information. And then you also must be able to discuss it with your stakeholders at like a very high, high level, right? Um, and low level. So like you got to discuss it to them where it's like, like you got to dumb it down. A lot of these guys are not very technical. Okay. You got to, you're the technical one, make it easy for them to understand. Um, but yeah, number four is usually it's like exploitation. Uh, so that's where you figured out, okay, this is where I can exploit it. This is the information I've gathered. Um, then you have post exploitation. And then at the end you have your reporting finally. And reporting is honestly, just depends on, uh, how you build it. Right. I use, I use, uh, like a notepad or something like that, or Google, Google doc as I'm going. And then at the very end, I will fix it. Um, but yeah, so again, I want to recap the difference between pen testing and red teaming because people need to know this. And a lot of times they think it's like synonymous. Um, pen testing is you're authorized. You are, you're already focused on vulnerabilities that you think, you know, um, you're usually already, you have credentials to get inside the system that they give you. Right. Um, red teaming, <clears throat> it's like a simulation. Imagine like a simulation of real world attacks. Um, you're testing the defense and, you know, you're working with responses, um, and you're also using various pen test tools. So pen testing, red teaming, very similar, except one is in already and one is out trying to get in. Right. So, um, red teaming is much more fun because you have nothing and you get to actually test your legitimate skills, I would say. Oh, you get to be like, you get to pretend to be the hacker that day, essentially, right? Even though like you are creating some disruption, but you're doing it in a place where it won't hurt the business or company. All right, that's a good one. And you know, I just have a question that I'm actually asking to everyone, to absolutely everyone whom I'm interviewing. Do you think in this case that technology can be, you know, considered that was our friend or our enemy? And why? What's what's Ooh. like the reason for that? Ooh, this is a good one. Um, <laughs> I always have good ones. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. No, no, your questions have been fantastic. I just want, I'm just trying to be mindful of time for you, but I uh, of course. Oof, I would say yes. It, it both uh, both amazing and and both an enemy. <laughs> um, and if we're talking about it's let's say enemy. Even, like it's a friend of me there you go like yeah honestly it that's that's a good way of putting it um are we talking about like for work related are we talking about for personal or are we talking about for everything well honestly yeah it, it depends but in, in this case i think um mostly re related to work let's say sure. related to work because work is important to everyone right yeah i mean absolutely i would say uh the world is always going to be changing with technology unless something was to happen where a flare a huge solar flare happens and we all lose everything uh technology wise but um i think in general it has helped system processes more uh it has brought i think more jobs actually to our workforce when you really think about it. I mean, yeah, it's auto right now with AI, it's automating a lot of stuff. Like it might take away marketing jobs first, to be honest with you, just because it's so good at creating blog posts and marketing and images. Uh, so maybe people get hurt there, but there's also now new jobs like AI engineering or AI prompt writers, people who are just very good at understanding on how to utilize and build artificial intelligence, right? Um, it's 
it's actually helping our programmers more create better code, secure code. It's checking their lines of code to see if it looks like clean. Um, and a lot of times our human code really isn't that clean. So like it's cleaning everything. It's really? No yeah. way. I mean, I heard, I heard some theories, you know, about that, but yeah. I wasn't really completely sure, you know, I, but I was really curious to see if that's really accurate, if there is an accuracy there. Oh, totally. It's, it's very cool. Um, so it does that and you just want to make sure it's secure. And then of course, like we have to check the code as well and put it through our system. Cause you never know what if AI got hacked again, right? And we got to, <laughs> and they cleaned up their code, but in reality, it, uh, who knows? But, um, but yeah, so there's that, but then you have the opposite side where again, it's taking some jobs. Um, and it, there's just so much more to do now, to be honest with you, <laughs> like you have to worry about so much more in a day-to-day -day life now, right? Where it's like my email, oh, I got, I got to protect this email now. I got to do this. That's the issue with this, um, ever longing battle with technology, I think is just the changes that you have to keep up with over and over again. But to me, I'm, I'm a curious person. And if I'm not always doing something, I get very antsy. So, so if you're trying to get in the world of tech, be curious, right? That's a big thing too. Um, and then I don't think your journey will ever be boring. Um, so I think right now for me, it's more of a friend than an enemy. I think it's helped me, uh, create who I am. Uh, and it's helping my journey even now. It's how I met you, right? Exactly. That's how we met through technology. <laughs> yeah, honestly. So I think, and yeah, I think what you're doing is great, by the way. Like I, I absolutely do. Thank I admire you. it greatly. Yeah, a thousand percent. Um, I think more people need to be ready for, uh, you know, joining the tech field and, and it's a great place to be in. I mean, it really is. So yeah, more of a friend than an enemy, but it can't be an enemy. <laughs> Just don't make don't make it an enemy. And uh, right before we end, if you don't mind, if I could say no, this last thing. <laughs> um, um, if people are really interested in getting into the world of tech, I actually, again, I help people create customized pathways. I don't agree with boot camps. I do not agree with college boot camps. They charge way too much money for no reason. Um, I actually have a vast network of 5,000 recruiters on hand right now that help people get positions in the world of tech like entry level and so forth. I created an amazing network of people. So please hit me up. We can work with you on actually how to get into tech, create a customized pathway on where you should get your certifications for, depending on programming, cybersecurity, uh, tech support, doesn't matter, right? Um, you, you tell me and we show you what we have available for you. And then we actually hook you up with a recruiter to finally get you into the world of tech. So that's, you know, you can hit me up again on Instagram at Keith's Lens. So K-E-I-T-H-L-E-N-S. Um, and we can work with you there and get started. All right. Thank you so much, Keith. And everyone, please check him out because he's great. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Karina. Thank you so much.